thank you all for coming. So I'm going to give a uh, part two of the of my talk. So this is on uh, sharp uh, non asymptotic bounds. Matrices with independent entries. This part two, and this is joint with Van Handel. All right, so joint work with Ramon Van Handel. Okay, so there's a few things that I uh, so. This talk is mostly going to be about proving the actual theorem. So I'm going to state it again, just to to remind you. And there's a few things about it that I that I didn't say that I wanted to say today. And then we'll go into the proof. Okay. So what the theorem says is that if I have so if I have a random variable, so if I have a matrix or a set of bijs, think of them symmetric. Okay. Think of them non-negative. And uh, think of i running from 1 to n. So give this uh, i j 1 to n. Okay. And now the, the, our task was to, to get bounds on the, on the spectral norm of a matrix, of a, of a random matrix, where each entry was Gaussian with the variance bij squared. So you define x, and by n, also symmetric. And now you take xij to be bij gij, where gij are all iid standard Gaussians. And what we wanted to understand was the spectral norm of x. And we saw that the spectral norm of x, an expected value, was bounded above up to constants. And we even figured out the right constant and everything, but it won't matter for now. And uh, so this will uh, sigma plus sigma star square root log n, where sigma was the maximum over i's of sum of j of b i j. So the maximum L2 norm row, or the maximum L2 norm of the rows of the b's, and uh, sigma star is just the L infinite norm. So max i j of b i j. OK? So I'm going to prove this. Before I prove it, I want to make a, just a few remarks. One is that we're assuming symmetry, but we don't actually need symmetry. Once you have an inequality of this type, for free, you can deal with non-symmetric matrices. So I just want to, the trick is, is really cool and really simple, so I just want to show that. So if you have a matrix, uh, say Y, is, think the same model but non-symmetric, Then you can just augment this matrix and make it into a symmetric one, and, uh, and uh, the spectral norm of the other one is still the spectral norm of this. So you make x, 0, y, y transpose 0. Okay, It's not so hard to see that the spectral norm of x is still the spectral norm of y. Um, x satisfies now the conditions of the theorem, so you can just apply it in x. In particular, this condition will now read, right? So this condition now you sum over i's, but essentially you're summing over rows of y and rows of y transpose, which are rows of j. So the sigma in this case will be the max, will be just the maximum between, uh, so the maximum between sigma one and sigma two, where uh, where sigma one is going to be the sum over the row, the maximum over the rows, and the, the sigma 2 over the, the columns. So we would get max over i j b i j square and sigma 2 Okay, because now they're not the same. And so you get something in terms of the maximum of this two, right? Immediately for free, because this matrix, you can just apply the theorem there. There's a slight issue, which is that we had this 2 here, 
And uh, now what we would get is two times the maximum. But really, if you, if you think of, a, of an example just with Gaussian entries, the right answer is one plus the other, not two times the maximum. But you can work a little bit harder and get that. But that's not, that's not the point now. I'm not going to be talking about that. But you can, in fact, get one plus the other instead of two times the maximum. OK, so the other thing I promised I was going to show is a tail bound. I'm just going to. Uh, just going to, I won't prove it, I'm just going to state it, and then I'll move to the, to the proof. To the proof of the, actual, of the actual theorem. So I guess I should call this theorem. Okay. So, so you can use standard techniques to, even though this is just for Gaussian matrices, you can get used standard techniques to get bounds for pretty much any kind of matrix, as long as it's nice enough. And one such bound that could potentially, can potentially be very useful is the following. Let's say that I have x, let's say symmetric, but uh, again, uh, you, could, you could just apply the same trick. And let's say that it's symmetric, and uh, moreover, that it, each of the entries is symmetri a symmetric random variable. So xij is symmetric. Okay, mean 0 symmetric, and you can just symmetrize and take away this uh, condition, but you would lose a factor of 2. And, but okay. So if you get it for symmetric random variables, you get it for everything. Right? This is symmetric in the sense of xx is the same as x transpose. This is symmetric in the sense of the random variable xij is the same as minus xij. Right? They're two different meanings of the word. OK. So, so now you can prove the following. You can, you can get a tail bound on the spectral norm of x that looks something like this. So, so uh, let me see. I... Okay, let me show. This one I think is more useful. So I'll... There's several you can get. I'll show the one that I suspect to be the most useful. And now I need to define all these things. Well, this is just some constant that depends on epsilon. And I need to define the sigma star is simply the, well, it's like the surrogate for sigma. So max over i of sum over j of, of now it's not bij because we don't have bij. So it's, OK. So the variance of each of the entries. And sigma star is, um, so that sigma star is just the maximum of each x i j. OK, so this should be, it's potentially random. Random as well, or you might be dealing with bounded variables. Let's say you have bounded random variables. OK, so if you think about, uh, right, so you can apply this in a large, in a lot, a lot of settings. And if you think about this conjecture that I pose, right? At some point, I pose the conjecture saying that that perhaps the the spectral norm of x looks a lot like the maximum, the spectral norm, the the expected value, sorry, of the maximum of i of x c i, right? So. open, right, then bound like this uh, gives sort of uh, giving exactly this intuition, right? Like it, for each i, this is sort of the expected value of each one of these variables. And then it has a tail that now depends on this parameter. And if you were to union bound, you have to union bound over n things. So it look a lot like something like this. And even though we don't know if this is true, I can get a tail bound that is, uh, has the same intuition in mind. And this can be very, very useful to, to use. OK, so I'm going to move on to the proof. Okay, any questions about what I explained? It's just, a, just a side remarks. I, the main thing really is the proof, what I want to show. OK. <clears throat> OK, so please ask questions. The proof is simple, at least the idea. Uh, ask questions if something is not clear. OK, so the technique we're going to use to prove this is the, is the moment method. So this goes back to, to Wigner, to how Wigner proved the, the semicircular law back in, I think, the 50s. And um, 
And so the idea is to, instead of controlling the spectral norm, we control the trace of x to a, to a large power. So think p large and think we're able to, imagine we were able to control what happens to the trace of x to the 2p. And these are moments, right? It seems easier to control at least. And so if you can control this, right? Let's say we can control this term. OK, I'm not going to put parentheses everywhere, but uh, this I mean that uh, 1 over 2p is outside the expectation. OK, so, so see what is each one of these terms. So the trace, so the trace of x to the 2p is simply the sum of, the, of each of the eigenvalues of x to the power 2p. Right? Is that clear? So this means that in particular, it needs to be smaller or equal than n, because there's at most n eigenvalues, times the largest eigenvalue, or the in, in magnitude, so see the spectral norm of x, to the 2p, and at least the spectral norm of x. Right? And so if you take it to 1, of the two, one over 2p, let's not worry about what happens with the expectation. If I, if I were to take it to 1, to 1 to the 2p, I would get, right, so let's say, OK. So this means that, I mean, I can't have expectations, it's fine. If I take to 1, 1 to the 2p, then uh, this means I get n 1 to the 2p, an expected value of x to p. OK, and the same thing here. OK, but the point is that if I, pick l n, if I pick p large enough, this will tend to 1. And particularly if I pick p looking like log n, OK, then you have something like n to the 1 over log n. And this looks like O of 1. It's around 1 or a constant. And so this means that this term essentially doesn't matter, and I'm really controlling the expected value. The, the, the expected value of the, or I'm really controlling the spectral norm. Okay, so the idea is that I'm going to try to evaluate this term, so, so, uh, so I guess objective or strategy is to understand what happens with x to the 2p for p of size around log n. Okay, so this is what we're going to be doing. Okay, and this is the intuition of why that would be a sensible thing to do. So now let's, OK, let's write out what is uh, the trace of x to the 2p. Right, so each entry, right, so, OK, maybe it's easier if I write, uh, does, does, ever, does everyone by any chance see this, of what, what this is equal to, the paths on graphs? Who hasn't seen this idea before? Two, OK. I'll do a... Uh, p equals 1, so that it's a little bit uh, more clear. OK, so what would be, right, what would be trace of x squared? Right, essentially you're summing over i. OK, is this clear? Right, and if I have trace of x to the 4, I'm essentially summing over all i1. So I'm going from i1 to i2, and then I have to go from i2 to i3. Make sure I don't have too many of them. And back from i4 to i1. Right? If you think about exactly what the matrix multiplication is doing, it's doing exactly this, right? I need to. Each pro the products look like this, and I need the last one to be the same as the first so that it lands on the diagonal and I get to sum it on the trace. OK? Is this clear? So okay, I'm going to erase this part, and now we, we, it's, it's fairly clear to see what happens in x to the 2p. So what happens is, so let me just uh, put, because I'm keeping track of the b's. So you have the sum. You need essentially indices from 1 to 2p. And they belong to the numbers from 1 to n, right? All your entries. And then you get something like, uh, so I'm going to keep all the v's in one side. 
and uh, and all the other uh, so we two three two p u one and then all the g's so right I have an expected value the expected value goes inside the sum and inside the v's and I get g u one u two g u two OK? Now, the nice thing is that since I did this, right, there will be a lot of terms here that will, that will be 0. As long as there's a g here that's by itself, since they're all independent, this expectation is going to be 0. Right? So essentially, what I have to count is what for, I only have to sum over, over, over paths. I can think of this as a path on a graph. Right on on end nodes, and I just have to th to sum over parcels of this type where each each uh, index shows up at least uh, shows up an even number of times because otherwise the sum is zero. Okay, so in particular, if if all the b's are uh, are one or zero, okay. So let's, let's say to explain the intuition better. So say b i j is equal to zero or one. Okay, then, well, if there is a term on which one, if one of the b's is zero, I'm also going to be zero. So essentially, this tells me that I can only walk if there is a one on the, the one on the entry that relates to u one e two, the entry that relates to u two u three. So I can think of G, the graph, whose uh, So the genus of C is B. Okay, and essentially, I have to walk on that graph because if I walk on an edge that's not on this graph, I'm going to get zero. And also, I have to walk over two P edges, and I have to do it uh, going each edge an even number of times. Is that clear? Or? Yeah. Okay, so what I have to do is count, given a graph, I have to count. How many paths of, I'm going to call them even paths, so paths where each edge shows up an even number of times. How many even paths are there on this graph that have, uh, that, uh, that have a length 2p? Okay? And this is essentially the proof that Wigner had, is just that since, uh, since he was interested in, the, in, a, in a very particular case and not necessarily controlling the spectral norm, it turns out that you only need to consider one type of even path. So let me show an even path for you. Let's say I walk here. Okay, let's say I come back now. Okay, let's say I have this path. So I go here and then here and then here and back and here. I go by each edge and, and two times. Right? One on one way and one on the other. And in particular, if P, if P is very small, it turns out that, and if your graph is complete, it turns out all you have to control is paths that are exactly of this form. So they're trees. And I don't know if you ever saw the proof of Wigner for the semicircular law, but it essentially is counting trees, and uh, this uh, gives rises to Catalan numbers and things that are, there's some recurrence relation, and essentially you can, it's, it's not very difficult. The problem is that, our p here is quite large, and so there's a, it's other more complicated paths start appearing. So get, let me give you a path that is not of this type. So I go up, and it doesn't matter if I go through many, many edges, and around, and around again. OK, so let's say that these are many edges. This is also an even path. OK, and if I'm counting trees, I can't count things of this type. Right, and you could think of things uh, much more complicated than this. Okay. And so, but so, OK, so I wanted to, um, for it to be clear is that th it really is what we're doing now is counting pa even paths of a certain size on a certain graph. Okay. 
So now let me look, uh, let's look at a particular graph. Okay, so let's say this is an example, and this example is going to be very important. Okay, so let's say the matrix of the Bs is of this form. Say it's some K. Here there's a bunch of ones. Same thing. So I'm putting a big one, I mean lots of ones. Okay? And here are zeros. Okay, let me call this matrix. So this will be my Bs. Uh, call C and uh, let me see. I don't. I don't want to move too far. Okay, here. Okay, and so what? What graph does this correspond to? This simply corresponds at a graph that has a, a click, so something that's completely connected among itself of size k and has lots of them. Right, so this is of n, so it's basically n over k clicks, right? So this is a click of size k, and there's basically n over k of them, okay? So to count the paths here, first I get to pick where I start, so I get n, time, n over k, which click I'm gonna be walking on. I can jump from one click to the other, and then all I have to do is to count the number of paths in one click. Okay? And in particular, for the counting the number of paths for one click is already difficult, but we know how to estimate this quantity for a click through other means. You basically use a Slapping and Gaussian concentration, and we know that if you have a click, so let's say that YR is a matrix, so a Wigner matrix, so, okay, so. R is symmetric. It's R by R. And Then it's known, and this I'm not going to prove, but it's not difficult to get, that, uh, let's see exactly what are the constants here. Okay, so Okay, so my point with this is that we can even though we don't actually go into the combinatorics, we can from that formula now, I mean we just would need to invert the formula, we can obtain the number of paths on this graph. Okay, because that for a y of size r by r, I could just take r equals k and this tells me the number of paths here and then I would just have there's the same number of paths here and so on and so forth. Now what I'm going to, so the way that we're going to show this is by arguing that no, so no other matrix, no other matrix that only has K, so let me switch K by D, no other matrix that has D ones on each row can create a graph that has more paths than this one. Okay, and now let me see if I can make this, uh, if I can explain this idea. Does anyone have any question? I, okay. I'm trying to make this intuitive, but I want people to get the intuition, right? So let's say that I have any graph, okay? It's just ones or zeros, so it's a graph on n nodes. When I say that each row has only d ones, I mean that each vertex has d neighbors, so the graph is d regular. 
Okay? Now I'm trying to count how many ways I have of walking around in the graph. Okay? So I have a general deregular graph. It e basically, you can say, okay, you start, you start somewhere, and you have n options to where to start. Then you get d choices of where to go. Right? You go, so you have d choices. You go somewhere, you have d choices again, and you go somewhere, or d minus 1 if you don't want to go come back, say. But if you allow yourself to come back, you would have d choices, and then d choices, and so on. So the number of paths would be uh, n times d to the 2p. Right? But this is the same as, as it is in here, right? Here I have the exact same number of choices. But I'm only interested in the paths that visit each edge an even number of times. Right? So out of all these paths, I'm only interested in a, in, a, in a portion of them. The one where each edge is basically repeated, and repeated an even number of times. So at least intuitively, and this is what the message I want to send across, and then I'll show you exactly how I can prove it. At least intuitively, if your graph is a small graph with lots and lots of edges, then you have a lot of more chances of repeating than if your graph is like a tree, very spread out. Because after I walk 10 times, I'm close to where I, to where I started on a click in some way, and so it's much easier for me to repeat edges than it is if I'm on a, on a tree and then very far away and I can't even connect to the things in the beginning if I wanted to repeat them. Is that is this intuition clear? Right? This is an intuitive basis for the proof, and then I can show you, and the proof is simple too. But I would like the intuition too. And so in particular, if we can show this, that in, in fact this intuition is correct, then our, our theorem is proved. Right? We, so you have to see that with this expression, then you would get what you wanted. I'll do that. But we, can, we have a way of counting paths everywhere by bounding them by what happens in this case. In this case, we can study with, with other more classical probability tools. OK? OK, so to make this, right, although this, this combinatorics uh, makes intuitive sense, we need to find a way of, uh, of arguing this. And the best thing to do in combinatorics is usually to get a good uh, bookkeeping device. So the way we're doing it is, given a path, OK, so let's say I have a path. Let's say this is vertex A. B and then okay, and then maybe I go back to A, then go here and here. And then back here, loop around this and then come back. Something like this, okay? And so A B and maybe C D E. Okay? And now I'm gonna I'm gonna for this path I'm gonna describe it in the following way. I see where I started. I always say that I start on vertex 1. And then I go to a vertex. If I've already visited, I use the number that I've described before. If I didn't, I use a new number. Then I go back to A. OK? Then from A, I'm going to E. So it says a new 1. Then from E to C. And then to D. And then back to E, so back to 3, back to f f Wait, now I confuse myself in this. Uh, right, so back to E and C. And E again, and then 1 again. OK? Right, I mean, you see the way I've constructed this, right? I'm going, and the point is that each time I visit a new vertex, I set up a, a new number for it. I put a new label. Okay? Given any path on any graph, I can, there's only one way of, of coming up with this description of the path. Okay? Now, there's, of course, lots of paths that have still the same description. All I need to do is to change this, uh, the labels, right? the labels here of these vertices. So I'm going to call this a shape. And so now what I'm going to show is that this, within each shape, this graph has more paths than any other deregular graph. Okay, 
so let's say that we have a shape. Okay, sure, why not that one? Actually, I don't want to, I'd rather explain without an example. Okay, so. Oh, we can use this one, sure. Uh, okay. Three, four, five, three, four. Okay, let's say that I have now a graph, and I'm trying to see how many paths are there with this shape. Okay, how would I do this? Okay, I can start wherever I want in principle. Right, so the number of choices, so, so number of paths, okay? And so the number of choices in the beginning, I can start wherever I want. So it's just the size of the vertices, okay? Then I have to pick a two, right? I have D neighbors, I have D options of picking this two. And then I have to go back. Well, if I could go from one to two, it means there's a, there was an edge, so I can always go back. So there's nothing here, right? Now I have to go to three, right? So I have to pick I have to pick a, a new, uh, a new, um, I have to pick a new vertex, right? So I have essentially the options, right? And then from three, I have to pick a new vertex, and again, a new vertex. And now I have to go back to three, right? But nothing tells me that the thing that I picked for five is connected to three. It might not be connected to three, right? So this can be, can be either, one, if, if three and five are actually connected, or zero. Okay, because I might not be able, right? It might be that by the time I got here, there's no way of going back, right? But on the click, there's always a way of going back. And so essentially, for any graph, this will be either a one or a zero, and for the click, it's always a zero. Right, so after I fix in the shape, it's clear that the click has, uh, has more paths, because I have more options. Now, I cheated a little bit. Did anyone pick up where I, so there's a, there's a part in which uh, there's a little bit of cheating going on. No. So the issue is this, is, is the following, is that So the issue is that by the time I'm saying four and I'm picking a new five, right? If I pick a vertex to be five that was already being pre-selected before, then I wouldn't have put it here a five. I would have put a one or a two or so and so on, right? So really what I have is not exactly D options, but I'll have D minus whatever vertices in the neighborhood have already been used, okay? In particular, in the click, I'm, as I'm walking, I'm going to use vertices. By the time I'm doing my kth step, I've already lost k vertices, and they are in my neighborhood. So the number of new vertices that I have to pick from is d minus k. But on a tree, for example, I always have d or d minus 1 at least fresh, fresh vertices, right? Because if I walk, so let's say that a D is three. Right, by the time I'm here, or I mean this D is four here actually. But, okay, so by the time I'm here, I still have three fresh vertices, right? It doesn't matter that I've used this one or it doesn't matter that I've used this one. Right, and as I go, I keep the, number, the same number of, free, of uh, fresh vertices. And so there is a way in which some graphs might have more might have more paths because I have more options to pick just because I didn't use up uh, vertices in my previous walks. So, so the way that we deal with this, 
this I think is a nice idea, is that, um, is that instead of arguing that, instead of arguing that any D regular graph So the number of paths that we're counting in any regular graph is smaller or equal than the number in this click example. So let's call this, uh, we call this, uh, right, so let's call it a click of size, say, D, right? Because this is not exactly true because of this issue that, I'm, that I've used up vertices. Instead of comparing with this click, I compare with a click that is a little bit larger. D plus P, okay? Because at the time after I take a, a ver after I take a vertex, after I take a path, um, an edge, the next time I might have uh, I have at least D minus one to pick from, and then I take another, I have at least D minus two, right? I'm only taking two P, two P edges, but there's only at most P new vertices for sure, and so at the end of, even at the last step, I still have at least D options. Okay, so, so this is a super intuitive proof that for any D regular graph, this number of paths is always smaller than the number of paths on a click of size D plus P. Okay, and I can, uh, now that I've explained the intuition, I can give uh, a, a slightly a more rigorous proof of this. Although I have 50 minutes. Okay, so I'll show, instead of giving a rigorous proof of this, which is essentially just saying everything that I said, but with the math formulas instead of intuition, I'll show you how from this you can get the actual result. Okay, so there is, okay, so Let's keep this in mind, and now, now I've only I've assumed that b was zero or one. But this idea works perfectly even if b is not uh, zero or one, because let's just say that without loss of generality, all my bijs are smaller than one. So meaning my sigma star is one. Okay, so I pick my first, uh, my first uh, vertex. I mean, this at most will be like an n, so it won't matter because at the end of the day, I'm gonna take, take it to the power of one over log n. So I don't need to worry about the first one. Okay, by the time I'm picking my second, how many options do I have? I have all of the, so let's say that I pick a certain, I pick one to be my, to be my first vertex. At the time I'm picking the two, I have the sum over all possibilities. say n, of what I would get by going, by, by going to, to the second, to, from one to two, right? I would be going from one to j. But I know that if I do this edge once, I, have, I am gonna have to do it again. So this, this b1j that I get, I would have to get it twice and maybe even more times. But since is at most one, I, at, I get at most this. So from the choice of which two to pick, I get, a, I get, a, I get this, at most this value. Okay, because you're essentially summing over all options and then as for three, I would get the same, right? I go back to one and then I go to three, so I would get j from one to n of b one three square and so on. So this is for sure smaller than Right, b i j square uh, max over i to the power of how many how many choices I have, so number of choices. Okay, and this is how exactly how this term shows up. And so, in particular, this is this is my d in a sense. So I need to co I need to compare. I need to make r here be that value plus p. So at the end of the day, if you run all of this. I'm not going to do now in the interest of time. If you, 
you get that for any x with any set of vijs, you get that the sum of, um, okay, so the trace of x to the 2p is smaller or equal, so I'll explain what comes here. The same thing for y, where y now is the clique of size uh, this value plus p. So, I mean, they need to be integers, so. so. Okay, so remember, this is sigma star. So I can just get. Uh, Okay, and there is, a, there is a little bit of a correction here because, so the issue is that this, this uh, graph here, right, I'm only looking at one of these blocks. So I only have, I've kind of, I'm already deciding which click I'm starting to count on. So I only have D options instead of N options where I have on the other side. So essentially you have to divide back by that, so. So this means, this in particular gives immediately that. Now we can plug in what comes from that bound here. Which is two. This means that uh, right. So if I take p to be like log n, which is what I explained in the beginning, then you get something like n to the one over log n. That's a constant, or you can make it close to one by picking maybe a large, a large multiple of log n. So you get, right, and we know that this is true too. Okay, so now P is log N. This term goes away. This basically makes up for that one plus epsilon that was everywhere. And now this is essentially two times sigma and then plus some constant times square root P. Right, and we we uh, we um, without loss of generality, we assume that this parameter is a one. So then we get uh, well. I'm not going to keep constants because it's not exactly two. It would be okay. And so if this parameter is not one, it's just the, the scale of the thing changes, and essentially what happens is you get this term here. Okay, and so this is how the theorem is proved. Now I, I try to give a very, uh, very, very intuitive uh, approach to the idea. I don't know if it was a clear, completely clear or clear at all, but uh, hopefully it's uh, right. Even though, yeah, once you have you have actually worked out these things with a bit of care, but the yeah, the, the skeleton of the idea is completely just what I said. There's nothing else essentially. Okay. All right. Thank you.